So I guess the first thing I would like to discuss about, and this is kind of a personal perspective of mine, um, one of the things that I really, really um, admire and I really, really like about your playing is how you swing on the EVI, how you bring this instrument in a jazz context. Uh, because I personally always had mixed feelings about iwi and bebop and swing and um, let's say the wor in the world of jazz, acoustical jazz. Um, but I guess when I heard you, I um, it was kind of sort of a confirmation for me that you know this is this is really great. This is um, it is possible. And not that not only that it's possible, it's even it should be out there. Um, I, I cannot recall the first time I heard you, but I believe it was somewhere uh, in 2008 when I came to Temple University as an um, exchange student from Amsterdam. Has uh, it been that long since you were there? Yeah, yeah it's 2008. Yeah. Wow. Crazy. Um, and then later on, when I started following your music, I, um, I came across these recordings you did with Ben Schachter. Um, as a uh, in a kind of quartet situation and i was totally blown away um so i guess my first question would be um what are your thoughts about the ev the evi uh in a jazz context um <coughs> maybe i should preface it first by saying that um the reason I got the EVI, because I he had heard about it in the 80s, um, was that I was always frustrated with trumpet because I, I was always jealous of saxophone players. Because saxophone players could keep playing and I'd get, be getting, my chops would be getting tired. And there was a, you know, there was a, a ceiling. There's so much I could play and I couldn't do any more. Then you, you, know, you start getting a lesser returns because your chops are tired so once i heard about the ev i was like i gotta get this instrument because i won't get tired i'll just be able to play and um and you've probably seen that miles davis interview that's when i had heard about the ev so i was all excited so that's why i was asking him because i totally was interested in you know so for me it was always at first you know, I didn't even, I wasn't even necessarily interested uh, or liked Weather Report at the time that much or electronic music wasn't really something that I listened to. I mean, I grew up listening to pop music and stuff, but I mean, once I got the EV, it kind of, I started to like, uh, I got it as a practice tool. And then I started to graduate into appreciating synthesis and synthesizers and electronic music and that opened up a whole world for me that that i'm thankful for you know and um so i was always using it in the jazz context because i'd work on vocabulary or stuff like that and then uh my earliest gigs were with charles fambro mm -hmm. have you heard of charles fambro no i haven't no i'm on a couple records with him um so he he's on like if you look at the Art Blakey stuff from um, from like the late 80s with Winton and uh, Billy Pierce and Bobby Watson. Charles is playing bass. Mm -hmm. And um, he loved the Eevee right away. So he would have me play it. And I would get backlash from, uh, you know, people would come up to me and say, like, why are you playing that? You should, why aren't you just playing trumpet? Why would you play that instrument? You know, and Fambo was always like, I like the Eevee, play it. You know, so... I was always playing it. I was playing it in a jazz context, not always, because at the same time in the late eighties, I started playing electronic free music with friends who I still play. We still play like several times a year and we record it. So we've been doing it for like 30 years now. And, um, and I never play bebop in that context. Cause that's not, it doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. And I remember even years ago, playing it like a bebop like once when we were playing electronic free and the drummer was like yo you know this is not bebop and it, he was right he was like this is it's not about that kind of language you know but um but i was always also doing it in the jazz context and it was a way for me to uh push my trumpet 
playing farther too because it would help it helped my phrasing mm. does that answer the question it does yeah okay. yeah i i guess i guess for me you know when i um when i try to play uh the jazz language on the iwi it is about more like you said the extension of certain things that you cannot do on your saxophone or trumpet right um and more about how it kind of um let's say changes certain habits that you have if you would play that on the saxophone or a trumpet right because of the structure right. of the instrument because the ability to play a large range uh, dynamical range um, maybe play two notes at a time sometimes three notes at a time and this kind of stuff so suddenly like the whole the whole game changes in terms of like the habits that you're creating for yourself so maybe you're getting new habits right and, um, that's kind of another thing or maybe I wanted to ask um, and this is from one player to another player uh, would you think would you agree that um, by playing the EV certain things change back to your acoustical instrument absolutely I mean a couple things I remember uh, I could with trumpet you kind of when you're in like a certain register let's say above concert F you kind of have to hear those notes pretty well because you'll start cracking. So the EV was a way for me to think a little bit sometimes and go, oh, let me try this and not worry about cracking. I could, I kind of pushed my ear because I would start thinking of like some kind of concept and, and it helped in that way. And it also helped, I remember um, certain guys like back when I was playing the EV, I go and sit in with Ori Kane. Have you heard of Ori Kane? And Ori was playing in town at the time, and he had said, he said to a friend of mine, well, on trumpet, he said, he goes, John sounds like he's swinging better on trumpet, he's smoother on the trumpet. And I think that that's attributed to the fact that I could play Evie and practice Evie. So, like, one thing I did when I was younger was I, I had, a, when I got the Evie, we, I did a, a master class with a guitar player who had the old Commodore computers. He had a Commodore Amiga, Amiga 500, and um, we sequenced at his house. We made up some sequences and then did the master class and played the sequences. And I was like, wow, you can do that with that easy? So I got an Amiga and I just put in tunes in 12 keys. I didn't even worry about chords. I just put in bass line and hi-hat click. So I had Cherokee, you know, it would be basically I had Cherokee in the original key and then I just but minus one, be down a half step, plus one, be up a half step, go through all the keys. It would take me 45 minutes to do Cherokee in 12 keys because I'd have four choruses of bass lines. So I would just come home, maybe after a gig, if I wasn't hanging out, play 45 minutes with headphones, Cherokee 12 keys. That just helped trumpet because I could go through all this playing time without even uh, messing with my chops and my brain was engaged in the changes and everything. So when I went back to trumpet, I was like, cool. I'm, you know, I, I, I saw the, you know, obviously there's specific things with an acoustic instrument you have to deal with. Right. But as far as the mental part of thinking about music and hearing it, the EV helped a great deal hmm. for me. Amazing, amazing. Um, I think about, what is it, 10 years ago, you released an album under um is it a local label called galato records am i pronouncing it yeah right? in new york yeah yeah in new york okay so um uh, it's called a boom right right um which i by the way i want to ask you what 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 it actually means because i don't really know it's a um i think it's an ohm you know what an ohm is mm -hmm. electronic ohm right it's it's a fraction of an ohm. I think it's a thousandth of an ohm. Okay. I think, and I wanted to call it ohm, like as the electronic ohm. But the um, David Lackner, who runs uh, the record label, was like, "No, Coltrane has a record called Ohm." I said, "No, he has Ohm. This would be Ohm," <laughs> but he thought it was too close, so we did Ab Ohm. So one of the things which are really interesting about this album. Um, is that it's all made by you, right? You made it on your computer, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. And so how did this, how did it came about? Um, curious to know. Um, David, 
had uh, he he wanted to be I had done a couple things with him, like some smaller stuff on that label, like we'd split a, a cassette or something, and then he was like, "Do you have anything you can do?" And I I said, uh, "Well, I have a lot of little things, but they're not all um, thought through. They're not like big pieces." And he says, "Well, let me hear them." You know, I'd have stuff for like a friend of mine was doing animation, so I made these things for animation, and then he never used them, so. We just pieced it together, different sequences, and, and put them together. And it, it, with the cassette, it's cool. It just fades into the next thing. Where the MP3s are kind of a bummer because they kind of cut off at the end of the tune and restart. So it was, about, it was just a bunch of sequences I had that uh, we put together. Now I have, I, ha I have to have like way more than I had back then that I got to figure out what to do with. You know, I got so many. I just want to figure out how to, complete the thought you know i seem like i get into making something and it becomes some kind of loop and then i'm off to something else and i feel like i'm not following through with a whole piece nowadays one of the tracks that kind of um got my attention was this track where you play a distorted guitar over a sort of a techno beat i think it's yeah like five or six something like that yeah and you know uh when i first heard that actually not not only me but we were like a bunch of friends checking this album out we were we were literally like trip we were tripping on this track because not only um did it sound great it also sounded very guitar like so like literally in the sense of like pentatonics l guitar language um i could totally see a guitar player like transcribing this and like you know and playing it uh was this a conscious thought I think, well, the conscious thought was I, I was using this thing called a voodoo valve, which I regret selling. It was like it had a little um, a little tube to it. It was a tube processor uh, guitar effects unit from like the, I think the 90s. Mm -hmm. And um, I think when I would get those sounds, I just would start to hear, because it sounds like a guitar, you start to almost play like you, like a guitar. You can't help yourself but kind of go into that. I couldn't go into that realm of, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because you start grooving on the way the sound is. And, you know, I always love how guitar players can kind of get that yeah. thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, for me, it was a, it was a, um, a very important moment in, you know, in, 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 let's say in my development as an e repair because I was, this track was always for me a sort of an, an, an um, how should I put it this way, sort of a um, concept of you know playing like instruments, you know. So if you 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 know you're putting a distortion pedal, you're gonna go now, you're gonna do something which sounds like guitar. You better have that language in your fingers, you know. Don't try to, like to mess around, uh, but rather try to be as much as possible to the real thing, as much as possible. Um, and um, you know I've been trying to do this this thing you know for some time uh, hopefully i'll succeed one day but um i was just curious to know what you know if it was a conscious let's say a conscious uh, choice for you I, um, well i think i i had played with the distortion for a while so i was pretty comfortable with and i had i admired that there were some guitar players in philadelphia i always admired hearing them with distortion and you know one that comes to mind for some reason is jeff lee johnson was a guitar player Philly, great player. And um, just how they would play with distortion was, you know, the way they get into the sound and not even have to move all the time even, just like dig on the sound. So that was a big thing for me, you know. Um, but I was gonna say something else in there too, I can't. Oh, but the master, I mean, you check out some Michael Brecker stuff, how he would do, he would be meticulous about certain things i think there's a i don't remember the track but i remember hearing him play like a guitar sound and he was like oh yeah really that's, that's definitely yeah he used to do that when he was playing solo like he has a solo piece in the show and he basically like will lay down all you know all sounds possible you know on the ewe basically and i think one of those patches that he was using was a distorted guitar um or even his violin patch from that one one of his records also where he's kind of playing this almost Irish sounding piece. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's uh, and it's, um, that's the first track from Don't Try It At Home, I think. It's yeah. been real, something like that. It's been real. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. 
Uh, yeah, and it's like a, you can tell he's just totally got down like the idiosyncrasy, yeah. you know. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. And this album just came about by just creating demos on, on your computer and then later just working out and see what comes out. And or was there a sort of a plan behind this or? Um, well, I started getting my sequences together, you know, finding them and putting them in an order, developing some of them longer. And um, I think I sent him some orders we talked about. And we, uh, we just kind of figured out the order of where things should be placed and how they should fade in. Right. And some of the stuff, there's a couple melodies that are like old, like literally from my Amiga. Okay. The organ one is from my Amiga 500, um, where it sounds like an organ kind of, and it's like a counterpointy. I forget what it's called. Church. We used to, we used to cover, by the way, uh, um, how's that? Bartholomew called? Babbitt. Correct. Babbitt. Yeah, you know it. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I, some... I, I covered that song. Uh, we, had, we had a group in, in Amsterdam um, uh, some years ago with a good friend of mine, Iran Arevan, and, uh, uh, and, a, and a singer. And we actually cover that song. Uh, we try to cover that song as much as possible. Uh, it's a great song. That's we, we loved it, especially when you know that that little kid, you know, uh, you know, uh, starts to talk there in the middle of the track. That's David Lackner. He oh, just, he, just <laughs> he just put his voice up because I said, Dave, you want to play on it or something? So <laughs> I sent it to him, and then that's what he sent back. And and then his wife was like, I used to like this tune until you did that. He, he, she told him until he kind of did that and kind of messed it up. But then I, I kind of grew to like it. Like when I heard it at first, I was like, what? And I was like, eh, I kind of like that, actually. What's the idea for the title? Um, What is the idea for the title? You know what? Could, I, it be, I could it be something from The Simpsons? I'm just thinking out of my head because of the sound of a voice, high voice, Bart. Something I like think, that. you know what? I, th I feel like I had an idea for it, but I don't remember what it was. Okay. I felt like maybe uh, I was thinking of a name of somebody who would be like exploring and just kind of walking around. Yeah, you could see it being like a Simpsons character in a way. Yeah, I mean, because of that voice, that, that was my thought. Right, right. So, uh, I don't know. Wow, interesting. And then you came up with these uh, these interesting play alongs that I actually um I just got them a couple of weeks ago and I love them. And you did it on the on the um PO thirty five, uh, right? Both these guys. Awesome. What yeah, great, so what a great way to play tunes. I was I was like, Yes, you know, you know, play alongs have been forever the same and suddenly you come up with these ideas and it's like, Wow, yes, loving it. Oh, good. I'm glad because it it's also fun with those. I don't, have you fooled around with those at all? I, I don't have the machine yet, so I just, you know, I just use the tracks you made. Well, the, what's cool of them, you know, they're limited, you know, so there, there's lim you can repeat, but it's basically the number of keys or number of tracks. And right. I think you can you can double them up. But but the, but the thing that makes them cool is there's these effects that you can change. It'll all of a sudden do some weird stuff. So when you right. hear it do weird I think I called them there. I either called them effects or tweaked when I did them on the on the when you download them. So I would just play one straight and then I would tweak the other one and just keep doing stuff to it to make it. So it's almost like you're getting thrown like a left, you know, somebody's throwing you a curveball or something. You're playing, you're like whoa, which makes it more fun and from from my perspective. Most definitely. I, yeah. Uh... I'm having a great time learning these uh, learning these tunes again. I'm glad. That's good. I've had a couple of people say that. I, it's, I never know if that's... I mean, for me, it was fun, but I didn't know if it was going to be fun for anybody else, but I figured I'd just throw it out there, you know. Well, you, you got my approval in any case. <laughs> um, let's see what else I want to ask. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, you know, maybe we, we can geek out for a couple of minutes about gear uh and um i guess my first question would be actually would be a confession as a matter of fact um i don't know if you're aware of it but um the dave smith evolver has became has become one of the most used synthesizers um for ewe players around uh, the world uh, really yeah uh, and funny enough i think the chain that kind of 
the fo the following order was that um, you played it, then I played it because I saw you playing it, and I was like, right. "Wow, what a great small thing that sounds amazing!" And then uh, my teacher in Israel, I got one, and then because of him, another friend of mine in uh, Poland, and I'm not sure if you know him, Lukas from the Art of the Wind Synth, got one. Okay. And yeah. And suddenly it became like a thing. Everybody started getting those evolvers. And um, but you know it's it's um, it's you are you are the original evolver. Um, how you know how w w how did you find this thing? Um, I was talking to Matt Trom, and he was talking about gear, and he had he didn't have one, but he had mentioned years ago when it came out. He said, "There's there's a uh, the Dave Smith evolver reacts to breath, and it's got a quick." you know, quick reaction time, he said, and I was like, and he goes, it's pretty cheap. It's like 400 bucks. So I, I just bought it. So that was when it came out. So I, I have like number 21 or something. And, um, and I have two of them. I have one here for in case at home. And I have one that I take to the gig. And then slowly, you know, I learned how to program. I still, it's still pretty much my favorite one because I can, I don't know if you've seen have you experimented with using the pedal? Uh, you're talking about via MIDI then? Uh, via MIDI. MIDI, the expression pedal, and using the, um, this, I'll show you. I'll put the uh, expression pedal in, and then I use the... Uh... Oh, yeah. Oh, wait, right. I guess it's backwards. MIDI selections, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I heard so, you do that, yeah. I think I came up with this recording uh with a, a philly band called three oranges could it be yeah yeah so that you play there um and I sam has one sam's playing in an evolver too yeah so yeah i, I it's it, that's the one that you use for the de for the delay effect right yeah so it just all it does is send in an, an extra modulation source to in through the ev and then with the new ewes not that it's it's i don't have it set up now i mean i have it set up on this one actually hmm. Uh, the new EWIs, the modulation source is also here, so I can have two different modulation sources. Right. So so in this case, I have this set up to the, the delay, and then the pedal uh, gives me an extra interval, interval for this particular sound, you know, so I can, that's kind of cool now. Now it's like I feel naked when I don't have that extra mo modulation stuff. Mm. You know? playing the, you're playing the Bergland uh, EWI, right? EVI. Yeah. yeah. I have two of them. Yeah. You just came up actually with an EV, uh, EWI, so EWI version, right? The EWI Rad. Yeah. Have you tried it? No. I must. No. I'm, uh, unfortunately, not yet. To be honest, I'm very much having uh, an amazing time with the old EWIs. Uh, I got my hands on the classical ones, the EWI 1000. Um, oh, nice. And. Um, there you mean a, the original, the original Kais? Yeah, the original Kais, right. You know, the, right. Um, uh, what is it, uh, e EMV2000 module and the EWI1000. Right. And I actually had it also, um, I swapped the plugins because uh, it had like a very particular input, you know, with a specific cable. And, you know, what happens if that cable goes away or, you know, bro breaks away, then the whole thing is just off. So somebody just exchanged it actually with a VGA with a screen cable uh, and now it works great so I can also well, so that's I, that was my frustration with my um, did I even oh, I gave it that was my frustration with my EV was that the cables would get so somehow the connection get weird and then they'd start the blip in a weird way or the, yeah. they'd start the uh, I can't remember exactly what happened they and it would it would just frustrate me but that's cool. That's good to know. Yeah, you can you can definitely um, you can definitely do that. I mean, I picked it up from somebody else. You know, one, one online somewhere. You know, Facebook groups. People are people who own them. They show that it's possible. And then I, you know, I found some electrician guy around, and he said, yeah, it's just a matter of like swapping the cables because it actually has the same type of input or the same type of structure. I don't know. That's great. I wish yeah, I would. I mean, yeah. I gave. I gave my EV, my old EV to my daughter. I don't know if she's playing it, but I can still maybe fix it up and so she can use that if she learns it, you know? Yeah. 
Because yeah. I also have, you know, the MIDI. Yeah. One out here. I have one here. I have somebody painting one of my other ones. Amazing. So. Yeah. Great. Um, so I guess maybe I'll ask you the last question. Um, what are you busy with at the moment? Um, I'm trying to figure out some of the, my other equipment lately. I have a, you have you heard of the synth strum deluge? Sorry? This thing's called the deluge. Okay. It's a, a New Zealand sequencer. Mm -hmm. So I'm fooling around with that and I have a, a diggy tack. Electron mm -hmm. Diggy Tech. I'm busy with that, but I'm also with the with the new uh, right. the, uh, the Ewe. I mean, the EV has the uh, CV stuff. Right. So I've been just fooling around with CV. I've been using playing through the Zero Coast. Do you ever see the Zero Coast? Nope, haven't. But I'll definitely. It's like kind of like they call it Zero Coast because it's like um, it's kind of in between. I don't know if it's on. So you can kind of, it's kind of fun to use CV as a change, you know? I don't know if the Zero Coast is really uh, the best thing for the EV. I think there are other ones that maybe would be even better with CV, like even the Neutron, the Behringer Neutron. Yeah, right, right, right. And, uh, you know, uh, even the Arturo Mini Brute maybe mm -hmm. has like some, but this one I've been kind of, it can, I, I had this one, the, the Zero Coast kind of packed away and I just wanted to experiment with it and use the work on CV and try to figure it out. That, that, it's a cool little synth because it chirps on its own. You can get it to start doing things on its own and, and it's kind of in between Euro Rack and normal thing you know right that's why i called zero coast because it's kind of like influenced by the east coast of synths you know like uh moog and also um the guy who did uh what, what's the now i can't remember um the other synth that was going on at the same time i don't uh sad i'm being interviewed i can't remember the synth but it's um it was the other school of early synthesis that was not using keyboards it, it didn't use a keyboard it was like uh yeah well i'll go i'll go find it out i'll go find out i should know the name because uh uh but it's, it's escaping me no. at my age <laughs> <laughs> you still see ben Schachter? uh yeah we still talk and i saw him last year i went to visit him okay uh, last year in arizona Oh, okay. Went back to Arizona. Okay. Yeah, he he just sent me a text. He sent me a text. Um, he'll send me stuff like he he said check out Bill Frizzell. He gave me a link to Bill Frizzell playing outside on YouTube hmm. with his trio. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. All right. Send him my love when you see him. I, I will. Him. Are you? So what are you doing? Are you playing? Uh, are you? Well, I um. I'm trying to play, as we all are these days. Um, I'm um, I'm actually kind of releasing soon some some new music. I have uh, um, a trio band called uh, Used to Be New. Uh, we have one album out, um, and now we're coming up with our second EP. Actually, we're making a double EP, but the first one's going to come up pretty soon. And the idea behind that particular EP is that we kind of went into more into power trio kind of style, rock and roll more. Uh, oh, nice. Definitely on on wawas and distortions and um, um, and it's every anything between I don't know early Led Zeppelin towards Chicora Electric Band I don't know if I may okay. kind of spread the word you know kind of how to um, and for the rest I'm still giving the cla I'm still giving an Iwi class at the Conservatory of Amsterdam. Oh, nice. Um, so it's a kind of a skills class for. Um, um, master students in general uh, that are kind of you know if they want to get a glimpse of what is it all about and just have a taste so they come to me for a semester and then kind of you know we have instruments at school so they can try it out and uh, you know we talk a lot we play a lot and, and so forth and so forth and of course you know every student comes that comes into my room you know first thing I tell them okay you like jazz John Swan 
I tell him that. Cool. So, uh, um, <laughs> um, and that's kind of basically where it stands at the moment. Um, using the time to create a lot of music and record and release what I can and uh, oh, nice. for a better future, I guess. I think I've heard some of your tricks. What I, whatever I heard, I can't remember what it was, but it sounded great. Thank you. Like Thank the sounds you're getting too. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's really really fun. I'm uh, I'm very dedicated. I'm I I want to be and I am very dedicated to the Iwi. I know you are. I love it. I love it. And um, that's it. So that's what it. what do you recommend for um? I think I saw you with the synth, but I think they stopped making it. I have a friend of mine who plays trumpet, bass trumpet, um, tuba, and he just he had shoulder surgery, so he got he got a an e a new EV. Okay. New Evie from Matt Traum sold him one of uh, Johan Berglund's. But um, he he got the old VL, you know, the VL. VL 70 m from Yamaha. Not the small one, the big one. Ah, uh, VL1. VL1, yeah. Yeah. So he got that, and I was telling him about the German company that I thought made, there was a German company that made, like, um, virtual, the same kind of thing. Wasn't there a... Uh, Dyna sample you're talking about? Yeah. Expression? Have you tried that? Oh, I have one. I own one. How is it? Amazing. I think that in, in um, if you're looking at physical moduling, if you're looking at sampled instruments, that's the best synth that I know. So it's better than the VLM? 100%. For, my, for me. But, uh, I mean, but, I love the VL70M, and it's, an, it's of course, it sounds great, but I think just the, the, the expression has... It's kind of like it feels like a step up, basically, in, in all by all means, um, dynamics, sound quality, attack, everything you want is just there. Um, he stopped making it. Well, he, he I think he um, he went down to a smaller version because the bigger version was big, so you have to carry a suitcase all the time with it. You know, it's like a like a computer. You know, it's almost like the size of a computer. Wow. You know, like a like a desk computer. Right. Um, so I think in a certain point he decided to uh, maybe uh, make just a smaller version, a monophonic version, because the first one, the bigger one is polyphonic. So you can do also a lot of rotating th uh, things, harmonies, and, 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 and. Uh, that's a bummer he doesn't still make that one, though. Yeah, Matt, wait, give him a call. Maybe, maybe he still has one. I don't know. Uh, well, he, my friend said he talked to him. He said he wasn't making them anymore, but, but he didn't mention the smaller one either. Well, it's on his website. So okay, I'll, I'll check it out. I'll check it out. Sample, and I think the small ones are called Espresso. Uh, okay, well, I guess what I'm, if I'm looking to get another synth, I mean, I have a, a Rev over here, a polyphonic uh, Dave Smith thing, but if I was going to get another s synth like that, I would want to get the one you have so I could fool around with doing voicing, you know, voices and stuff, which I haven't done a lot of because I'm always playing on a monophonic synth. Right. Well, you I mean, know, is, is a computer a possibility for you or you want to avoid that? Yeah, probably eventually I'll get like a laptop and just have it like exclusive for uh, right. you think that's a better way to go? Well, actually not, to be honest. Oh. I, have, I, I, for me personally, I always like to get away from laptops because laptops, you know, they, they just it's too much work to deal with them to make sure that they work and they don't break down. They don't crash. I don't know. Yeah, they seem digital, digital noise. I don't know all these kind of stuff. You know, I'm still playing. I still have a suitcase with my, you know, my Oberheim and my Evolver and my Lexicon reverb, and that's what I do. You know, I just go like that. I mean, my back hurts a lot, I must say, but at least you know the sound and the quality and the liability of it is just there all the time, hundred percent. Yeah, I like I like the hardware too. I feel it the same way. I feel like the computers yeah. is something could happen, and you don't even know what's. Just I mean, in computers, there's a lot of solutions. You can find a lot of solutions. There's the, the harmonizer from, uh, from the Dutch guy, actually, that built. Uh, he wrote a software called uh, the MIDI Harmonizer. Uh, his name is Johan Lunga, but you can read it as Louis Jenga. Um, and he wrote a MIDI, soft, MIDI software plugin called the MIDI Harmonizer, which is basically what we all know what Brecker did back in the day, just in VSTs. And I use that a lot. But mainly for practice stuff, not for, I don't take it to gigs and stuff like that. So. Right. Um, I do, I actually, well, I asked Karabi 
Kilgore because um, I know that he's also busy with creating a physical rotator, a sort of a you know small machine that you can just MIDI in and out to a polyphonic synth. And then on that, basically, you can program certain rotations, certain voicings, and you can just take that and use it in your analog gear. That's interesting you're saying rotating, because it reminded me, like, years ago, I had a T TX81Z. Yeah. And um, it would have uh, eight voices, right? Right. But you could, I could cancel one of the eight and make it seven. So every time I would play a chord, it would play the first four notes, one, two, three, four. Right. Then the next time I would play a voicing, maybe it was even the same voicing on the EV, but it would be five, six, seven, one. Right. And then two. So if they were in different octaves, the voices, then the voicing would sound sound like it's changing all the time because it, it was grouped in, it was seven, but but I was playing a, a chord that was four voice chords. So it would keep moving one over. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that the same kind of thing as a rotating? Yeah, it is. Actually, yes. Oh, okay. The idea, the basic idea was that, you know, you could, well, it got born with the expander, the Wolverham expander, this huge thing, uh, 12, 12 voices in, where you can actually have certain zones, where you can actually um, make certain voices out of the 12 go randomly in a certain algorithm that you can put it in. So you had like, you could play the top note, and then you had two um, zones which were like an interval, which is always a fixed interval, and then the rest of the voices can basically just move as they move along and then the way that you kind of tuned it this was the way that kind of um the, the the chords were coming out in a very kind of uh you know polyphonic crazy way right right um, that's great that's kind of the idea behind it and um the mini harmonizer is great for that i mean if you use computer definitely i can recommend you that is it because it did it make it for the ipad too because i've been playing through my ipad um not sure I'm not sure. You have to talk iPad, to. Uh, iPad's kind of fun to fool around with. I don't know if you've done much with the iPad. Yeah, I tried it. I mean, I'm, you know, I mean, um, I can't. Nothing beats the analog for me. I don't know. Digital stuff is great, but. No, absolutely, absolutely. I, I feel the same way. But like for me, like there was a period last year where I would wake up, drink coffee, and plug this in my iPad. Yeah. I know. And. Yeah. And just fool around and play without even, I mean, not even being out of bed. I just go, eh, da, da, you know, like it, it, it was convenient. Right. But yes, on a gig, no, because also what I like about the Evolver is it has that high pass filter in, in the, and, and if you don't put the high pass on, sometimes the low notes just get too wolfy and big. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. 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 So, I mean, I guess you can have an equalizer or something too, but, and, yeah. Like analog is just still better than digital. Bottom line. It, it, I think the idea behind it is just it doesn't sound the same all the time. And every time you plug it, it's something else. And then it's like, oh, okay, so let me, you know, EQ it a bit. Let me do some, uh, it's just like that. I mean, especially with the 1000, the EV1000, every time I put it up, I turn the machine on, it's like I have to, you know, I have to spend like five minutes just tweaking the knobs again. So I'll feel comfortable. Uh, oh, that's wild. It's really like that. Um, have you fooled around? Oh, go ahead. No, no. F finish. Yeah, so it's just, um, I think even the, the technology back in with the first EWI, this EWI, is uh, the, the, the sensors are just much more rough. They're not so sensitive as, you know, the, the, the EWIs that came after it. So it's like really physical. It's a physical EWI. You really have to work hard, you know, to make it sound. Right. Um, kind of, you know, that's the... But I kind of like it because, you know, it kind of imitates that, you know, that physicality of a saxophone with a hard read or something, you know, so you really... And the mouthpiece is the same as the, as the mouthpiece that you have on your new EWI. It's not that 4000S mouthpiece, but it's, the, it's that one, this one, particularly that one. So, and I, and okay. it's, it just feels really, really nice the way that it, you know, the, 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 the way that it's constructed. I, I would imagine eventually that's going to wear out. The, I mean, the, the breath sensor and stuff. Actually, it didn't. To be honest, it didn't. Well, mine hasn't worn out of my EV either. I mean, I, and I oh. bought it. Yeah. Or even the Peak. Have you checked out the Novation Peak? Any Novation stuff? You you like the analog. Okay. Yeah, I will check it out. I haven't. You know, I'm in the meantime. I'm very much happy exploring my Matrix uh, 1000 Oberheim and Evolver. Yeah, I got and my. I got a 1000 too. Yeah. Yeah. So these, you know, these machines for me are still. 
and the 1000 are still kind of like I, I still haven't found the full potential of them so i'm kind of busy with them still um, absolutely yeah i feel the same way i mean because the more yeah. you can keep going on a path and never master the one you just but i, I johan had mentioned on facebook he said his go-to one now it seems to me he's really enjoying going to the novation peak okay i will check it out yeah but that's out. not analog that's like the novation stuff is you know virtual analog but it's a pretty powerful okay thing. yeah awesome i haven't checked it out i'm just now i'm kind of like just looking at stuff 